всички. Чуваме ли се? Ало, ало. Изведнъж гучката започва да замира, надявам се, да. Здравейте, аз съм Любо. А... Здравей. А... Радвам се да вие толкова много хора по време на пандемия. Това със сигурност е добра идея. А... Днес за ваша беда, аз съм вашия а... хост. А надявам се, с удържание да бъдем на гостри, обаче да е фантастично. А... Днес сме решили да заходим отново към една лекочка покрива тема. Последните няколко седмици даже започнахме да правим и някакъв подкаст епизода в тази посока. А, приятелите от Капитал също пуснаха една доста интересна статия на тема на психоделици, CBD и така нататък. А, и решихме по нали, стара родопска традиция да се опитаме да направим и събития по темата. А, естествено, а, тъй като ние в никакъв случай не сме специалисти, решихме да хванаме подкрепата на истински такива. А, та, заедно с нес, днес а, са доктор Ервин Иванов, а, който е а, лекар и доктор по а, фармакология. Ервин се крие в момента зад един човек с дълга коса и не смее да ме погледне. Ервин, ако искаш, заповядай насам. А, Ервен има съществен интерес в посока а, психотелици и психотропни и непсихотропни вещества, които влияят върху тялото и ума, които според мен са едно и също нещо, но нека да не влизаме в този разговор. А, и на второ място, но не второ в сърцето ми, е доктор Грег Дън, а, този ужасно красив мъж с сако, а, който ще излезе сега с чаша с лимон. А, Грег е невроучен, както и точно така между живота. <плес> нали, той, той е цветът на Филаделфия, а, както и други неща, които мисля, че го имбераснат достатъчно. А, както някои от вас, може би сте го виждали на някои предишни наши събития, той се занимава и с изкуство. А, може да отидете на gregdan.com, прави феноменални micro и така нататък които изобразяват мозъка и прочие много-много яки неща. И тъй като не искам да влизам в безкрайна алегория на тия теми, само накратко ще ви разкажа за какво ще си говорим днес като структура, а, а именно искам и се да направим по-скоро разговор, по-малко презентация а, върху тематиката. Ще се опитаме да навигираме разговора през малко Добре, история и евентуално да влеземе през... А, някои от, няко от проблематиките, които са свързани с а, а, психадериците към момента. А, това ще отнема около час, час и нещо. А, междувременно силно ви приветствам да а, отидете на slide.do Я някой да пусне картинката. Anyone. Отидете на slide.do през телефоните си и съответно там може да се скоче DMT, да задавате въпроси на база, да, DMT естествено. Това е кратко от Димитър. Um, <laughs> може да задавате въпроси съответно на двамата ни гости а по време на събитието, които в а, добрия случай нали, и при наличие на фокус от моя страна ще бъдат зададени относително адекватно нали, след около час, час и нещо, когато приключим основната част на нашата програма. Ето, слай точка до Димитър. Добре. Еми, сега е момента вече, когато приключвам на а, английски, за което ще ме извините, обаче просто така работи, така че а, учат езици. <laughs> hey guys! Yo! Hey. So, is this awkward? What's that? Is this awkward? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> But it's just like us hanging out in a bar, you know, it's like there's nobody I here. I know, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, let's, let's make it like double awkward. Let, let's start with the story. What, Great. What would you say? I mean, do you have the perfect bar story right now? I got a good bar story for you. Not as uh, colorful as psychedelic stories go, but figured you'd start with, uh, with a little anecdote. Um, and uh, I want to tell you about this guy who lived in San Diego and was in a terrible accident and lost a leg. And as some of you may know, you know, when you lose a leg, you lose this physical part of your body, but you don't lose the neural correlates of that physical part of your body. So there's still some little circuitry in your mind going, I have a leg, I have a leg, I have a leg, that doesn't necessarily die with the leg. And a lot of people in this instance uh, suffer from a problem called phantom limb syndrome, phantom, uh, phantom pain, where their brain, through the lack of input, turns these circuits into something which is actually giving this feeling of pain that is with you constantly. It's a horrible condition. 
So this guy goes to a neuroscientist at uh, University of California, San Diego, and talks to uh, this famous uh, neuroscientist, neuroscientist Ramachandran, and he says, can you help me? And he says, yes, I have a mirror. Let's do an experiment. So dude left to, lost his left leg. They put a mirror on this side of his body, and they say, okay, I want you to take your right, up, right leg out and kind of dance it around like this. You know, just kind of relax, like, ah, oh. and look at the reflection of your right leg in the mirror tricking his brain into thinking he all of a sudden had a left leg. That's how stupid your brain is, is that it believes Amazing. that this re reflection is actually the real thing. And sure enough, that sense of like clenching horrible pain released. And he was like, oh my God, thank God. And then they take the mirror away and just comes right back. Those, those circuits are deep. You know, you're not necessarily changing the orientation of how the neurons are connected in this case. So sure enough, what was step Step two, plan B was give this man some psilocybin, which is the uh, active ingredient in psychedelic mushrooms. And in this case, with therapy, where the therapist is taking him through the process of imagining his limb, imagining the circuits sort of dissolving in his mind, whatever you want to call it, the combination of this psychedelic, which is a, which is a, a very powerful indur inducer of neuroplasticity. So it's helping us to change our circuits in a very defined amount of time, that this solved his phantom limb problem for the long term. It's not something that just came back. It was something that was, uh, was fixed for, for quite a while. So you hear anecdotes like this all the time, and we wanted to tell a little bit of a longer story about how this might be possible and what are the miracles it's capable of. <laughs> so, so what you're saying, it was not practical to carry a mirror forever? Just on the side of his uh, He body, tried it for a while. Yeah, it got something him into all kinds of different problems, like when he was going to the bathroom and stuff. It's just <laughs> Minor problems. issues. Yeah. Minor issues. Well, okay, so uh, would you like to jump in with some random tidbits? Yeah, if I need to mention about cannabis, so everybody will think about 420. Like, what, what, 420. what is 420? Skill shot What is 420? Yeah. Every, everybody heard about 420, but uh, turns out that the story is a bit boring. But it's, yeah, it just Perfect. hooked up. So, yeah. I mean, like some Californian students, probably. Yeah, from Me, your for region. Example. From your region. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they were gathering in at exactly at 4.20 o'clock uh, after school to look for a treasure from a drug dealer, grower, let's say, who actually somehow buried some cannabis around like big quantities and the story is that they were looking for that quantity and every day 420 they were meeting smoking cannabis and looking for that treasure to find it yeah so that's for that's 420 that's why it's hooked up sorry it's a boring story but <laughs> wasn't, it, wasn't it because of the goddamn police codes for the thing when, when they call up wasn't this the I heard that too, but I don't know what the causal relationship is here. Actually, probably nobody knows. Okay, so 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 far we began with two stories which are unverifiable and yeah. probably um, bullshit. Yeah. So I hope you <laughs> enjoy the value for your money so far. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. You haven't shared a story, man. No, I just pull one out of your ass like we did. <laughs> no, uh, look, the, the way this works is I'm putting you on the spot. Uh -huh. uh, it's not, it go only way. goes one way. So, um, yeah. where's Petco? Uh, let's try and, you know, let's try and look at some of the history for psychedelics. Because, you know, in the 60s, it used to be kind of a thing. I mean, um, not that I was born. Uh, I mean, even though I look like Dracula, it doesn't mean that I was actually present for the whole thing. Um, but it used to be kind of a thing, and with time, it's kind of uh, faded away into illegality, essentially. So what happened, basically? Well, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting up the, some slides, we have a couple uh, things to show. But yes, I mean, I, I guess the, uh, the recent history would be that, if we're talking about the, the Western world, uh, the world of hippies and that sort of thing. Uh, <coughs> The history in that facet doesn't necessarily go back for very long, but these substances are found all over the world in all kinds of different plants and fungi. <clears throat> and one of the most fundamental things about a person is that they want to get fucked up. And <laughs> what? So they, you know, they've got a place where they're storing their fruit. The fruit is rotting. It turns into alcohol. It makes them feel funny. They're going to drink it. It's basically as as natural as like the sex drive as needing to eat food. So. It's happened all over the world. In particular, I would say in Central and South America. And I'm going to pull out my 
nice illegal laser that's going to blind all of you. Look at this. <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> so psychedelic mushrooms are found all up and down here. I've got a special, um, special map for that as well. Mescaline, uh, which is a classical psychedelic that's found in, in peyote uh, and in San Pedro cacti, was used, there's records from it being used many thousands of years ago. In South America, of course, it's famous for ayahuasca, which is uh, DMT plus another ingredient which helps to inhibit an enzyme in the gut. Uh, ibogaine is uh, indigenous to Africa, as well as our, uh, some mushrooms. The ergot fungus, uh, which infects rye, was something that has kind of a notorious history across Europe. Um, this produces lysergic acid uh, analogs. This is something that's like a precursor to LSD-25, and it's something that Albert Hoffman was experimenting with when he discovered it. Uh, the Vikings and the Russians like to eat these uh, Amanita muscarias, which has got a compound called muscamol, which is not commonly used these days, nor is it a classical uh, psychedelic. But India, far back in the Vedas, their classical spiritual literature has uh, references to soma, which a lot of people believe is probably mushrooms. Um, this is the distribution of psychedelic mushrooms that you can find all over the world. Uh, there's something like 200 species which carry the active ingredients psilocybin and psilocin, and I think that this is underestimating it, quite frankly. Uh, you can find them pretty much anywhere you have rain and grass, uh, and that ends up being a hell of a lot of places. So this being the case, it's not necessarily that one culture discovered it and it, its use sort of spread around. It's something which would have kind of popped up all over the globe uh, in different periods. And so this is something that's been used in a ritual context for thousands of years before, I guess, if you want to say, like, white people discovered it <laughs> in uh, the 40s, 50s, something like that. So Albert Hoffman uh, discovered LSD in, I think it was 1938, and then isolated psilocin in the 50s. And that's what, uh, so a lot of the intelligentsia was using these substances and became excited about them. Timothy Leary got a hold of them, told everybody to drop out and become a bum and get naked. And uh, that scared the shit out of the authorities, and they said, this is, from here on out, going to be illegal. So shut down all your labs studying these incredibly important substances, and let's go back into the dark ages for a little bit. So now we are thankfully coming out of that period, and that's the short story. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, you should write a book. Don't. <laughs> Please no. Uh, so, I mean, would you say that uh, would you say that there, there wasn't any uh, due diligence into making them illegal in, in the first place? I mean, I'm 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 going into that territory initially, but uh, would you say that uh, there were other substances that would be uh, more nefarious as compared to psychedelics? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, one thing that uh, we all thought it was kind of important to address in this talk is. This thought that, you know, we're all kind of raised in a society that tells, talks about drugs. Drugs. Everything is a drug. Every single thing that is around us is made of some kind of chemical composition, right? That, that you would put psilocybin in the same category that you would put cocaine, that you would put in the same category as heroin, is a, an outdated and kind of absurd concept. And that's something that we want to talk a little bit about right now. But it's not like... You know, the head of the DEA was the first person to experiment with LSD, and that's why it got outlawed so fast. It's because these are powerful substances, very, very powerful. And I, for one, am not an advocate of full legalization immediately. I think that there needs, we cannot repeat the same mistakes that we repeated in the 50s and 60s. I think there's got to be a, a more kind of deliberate rollout, uh, studying under, you know, kind of tight clinical conditions so that we can convince the population that these are uh, worthwhile substances, and that's something that I hope to convince you all of today. And I've been given that you're knee deep in psilocybin. Uh, <laughs> what, what what is your uh, like point of view on specifically uh, legalizing, let's say, cannabis specifically or other substances, given that you're experimenting with these uh, uh, as a company? Yeah, so I believe that uh, any substance needs to be legal to be used in the medical field because it's it's a new it's it's an instrument for the doctor to use it, um, and in the medical setting, any substance if there is a benefit, like if you, if you put a benefit risk to benefit ratio, and if there is more benefit to use a specific drug uh, instead of not using it, so it's better to use it, of course. So I'm I I of course 
any substance would be beneficial. Like um, that's why there is morphine and there is fentanyl. Both are legal. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine and there are medical applications that you prefer to use fentanyl than morphine. In the same case that you can use psilocybin, you can use MDMA, you can use THC, you can use any drug that, that, uh, that the doctor decides that it's beneficial for you, of course, why so not? It's basically legal but with some restrictions, some, some barring of access. Yes. So, um, if there is a benefit to it, why not? Um, yeah, so. But uh, something that we, we began with, basically, these substances have been in, in various cultures throughout the years, uh, even talking about ancient cultures. Uh, the way that they used them wasn't necessarily recreational, though. Uh, while the major issue uh, of people treating them just with, as drugs, which is a common theme, is that you know some random teenagers will get fucked up, yeah. essentially. So <clears throat> it's uh, it's it's a different setting and it's a different uh, context for um, for for those substances. So what kind of um, what kind of guarantee do we have that they would be indeed beneficial if uh, just left into the wild, rather than having the same kind of care and uh, you know adequacy in using them? It's a massive question. There's a lot of research that's being done right now on set and setting, which is set is basically where you are mentally, what's going through your mind, what kind of experiences have you had in your life. Setting is where are you? Are you listening to music? Or do you have a therapist in the room? Do you have people who you trust? Uh, are you in nature? Are you not? Are you undergoing some of these rituals, music, dancing, that sort of thing, which is traditionally part of the psychedelic experience, which is treated with awe and reverence, which it deserves to be. Uh, in many indigenous cultures, uh, and that because it's powerful stuff. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and they realize that uh, you know being naked at Woodstock may or may not be the best uh, place to do that. Not saying people don't have transformative experiences; they most certainly do. Uh, but you're, it's more of a roll of the dice, you know, if you're not in a safe environment. So when you say a roll of the dice, I mean, what was the kind of risk that we, that you're gambling with, essentially? But well, because. I'm obviously drinking alcohol, mm -hmm. and normally I'm not drinking uh, random shitty beer. Uh, rather, it's some kind of horrible alcohol. And I can basically uh, gauge what kind of risk I'm taking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a bunch of stuff like liver damage. I could be um, inadequate. You know, I can be a danger to myself and others, etc., etc., etc. How does... Because I don't have the same sensibilities for psychedelics. What are those dangers? Well, um, one of the major dangers is you don't know what the hell you're taking. I mean, even when you're picking mushrooms in the wild, for example, I mean, like I said, these are all naturally occurring substances, at least most of them, the exception of MDMA and, and uh, LSD, that you don't know how much you're going to be taking. You don't know if you're buying it on the street, you have no idea what it is. I mean, unless you're a chemist and have, you know, access to some NMR you know, spectroscopy machine, you, you're basically, you know, have no idea. So that's that's a big deal. I mean, as Edwin has said many oh. times, it's very important to be doing these studies with a with a known substance, something which is synthesized. Known in the quantity, lab. yeah, uh, and known quantity. Yeah, mm. natural products have deviation, natural deviation. So one mushroom cannot be compared to a second mushroom, to a third mushroom. One can have five milligram, the other one can have seven milligram, ten milligram. You don't know. And the the dose response ratio, particularly for psychedelics, can be very very steep particularly when you get to the point where you start to get the more dissociative states, having only a little bit more can catapult you from like, dude, look at the trippy colors, to like, what the fuck am I? You know, it's like a really intense experience, and if you're not prepared for that or with people who understand what that's like, uh, it can definitely be uh, sketchy. So, so basically yeah. psychologically traumatic. Yeah, it can be, yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I think it's really important to be doing this kind of research. People who tend to have, so on one side of things, um, this group in, in London led by uh, Dr. Carhart Harris talks about how you have the, a spectrum of consciousness where on one side you have disorders which are more characterized by very fixed circuitry in your mind, like, um, like depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder, things where thoughts are very ruminative. You're using the same circuits over and over again. It's hard to kind of get out of your head. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have 
very little coherence between your thoughts and what a psychiatrist would call thought disorder, something like schizophrenia, um, some dementias probably fit into this category as well, where there's not so much linearity between your thoughts. Every moment is kind of new. Those are the states which are particularly dangerous to be giving people psychedelics in because it exacerbates those types of thought disorders. And this could be this could be ongoing. I mean, it wouldn't be an effect that lasts for a short amount of time, but it could potentially, given the the uh, quantity and the, the type of uh, substance, it could be something that would leave a lasting uh, effect. The reason I'm saying this is uh, because we, we began with the, with the funky visuals and uh, happy mushrooms and, you know, eyes in the trees and weird shit. Uh, and it looks slightly not very fucking serious. Uh, at the same time, I think we all believe that this is something that should be taken with care and with some good foreknowledge that this is actually something that makes it. It's not just, you know, it, you're not just having a fucking burger with, uh, uh, with uh, Zero Simon. So the reason I'm trying to focus on this is uh, this is serious shit and it's not something easily just digestible. Uh, by anyone, so you should be you should be minding it with care. I don't know why I'm trying to focus so much on it personally, but I think it's important to say it. That's incredibly important. I think that that's exactly how you de delegitimize the field. That's what they did in the '60s. Just like literally everybody drop. Oh my God! Like you've never seen the movie Elf. Fucking drop everything that you're doing right now and go see that movie. You know nobody likes that shit. That's what people were doing. It's just this like psychedelic evangelism which just doesn't help it really doesn't help which is unfortunate because a lot of people after they take it for the first or second time feel that way um i was going to ask edwin did, did you want to go through some of the the history of yes. use of marijuana as well for sure do we have a slide about it yes not exactly uh, yeah let's go let's yeah. go to the the other uh, the, one yeah some cans here you can use my laser gun yeah the legal one not in the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay, uh, probably everybody knows that cannabis was used like 6,000 years ago. Like all over the world, everywhere. Like wherever you can find mushrooms, you can probably find cannabis around. Excellent. It's yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so it's 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 a weed, and it's also like some um, like uh, wet and rainy places, but otherwise it grows pretty much everywhere like Chinese used it uh, Indians use it a lot like Indians love to actually grab cannabis flowers rub them around the hands to, to leave them alive of course you leave them alive you just collect the resin from the flowers and then with the knife you can just scrape the the resin yeah and that's called karas yeah and you then it's like a type of a hashish and you scrape it from your hands. Yeah, yeah, of course. With a knife. With, together with the hand cells, like like with epithelial cells. Yeah, um, it's excellent. part of the that mixture. You know, the Indians love it. Yeah, delicious. That's, uh, I don't know. That, like that, that's what they do. That's the traditional yeah thing. And then it's like a hashish, and then they smoke it. Yeah, it's like I don't know. That's their method. Yeah, and yeah. So cannabis was used all over, like Russia, Europe. Uh, Africa, like you can find cannabis anywhere. Like that's why there are like five thousand strains of cannabis, like Afghan strains, Indian strains. Which is the best one? Colombians. Yeah, there is no best one. There are different. There are just different. Yeah, like any. You can like that one or this one. There, I will explain later on. There is the indica, sativa differences, different effects. You can modulate the effect. You can have uh, different experiences with the same substance, THC, the only psychotropic substance, but you can have different experiences with other substances inside. Cool, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's actually the, let's say, you, th there is a small difference if you look at the plant. So indica and sativa and ruderalis. So indica is more bushy, more like a tree, you know, like more bushy. Sativa is more tall. And there are differences in the leaves. And ruderalis is mainly a genetic variant that grows in the colder climates, like Russia and the northern Europe. And it's a very small plant. Also, the very interesting thing about ruderalis, it's, uh, it's an auto-flowering strain. So it means that it just flowers anytime it decides to. Like uh, Otherwise, the other plants, 
um, start flowering after a specific photo period. Like the day needs to become smaller, like 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, and then they start flowering. Ruderalis doesn't care about that. And yeah, the the, the difference so between whoa, whoa, whoa. so there's no yeah. correlation between any like I don't know day night cycle some yeah Roderell doesn't care about that stuff. no it's just decides to that today I'm going to flower and then it's just flowers yeah where is the biologist yeah because actually because it it grows in the cold colder climates so in the colder climates you have very short periods of summer with very short periods of days so the, yeah it needs to yeah which gives you very interesting strains that uh, you can grow anytime, anywhere, and they just start flowering. Hmm. Like, cool. Suddenly, genetically, yeah. And the difference, the main difference between these strain, the, this, let's say, two categories is the accompanying substances together with the THC, like the terpenes, which I will explain afterwards or on the, on the next slide, probably. Yeah. So yeah, the, the composition of cannabis is very broad, like it has many substances inside. I'm sorry for the perfect quality of the picture. Um, but the, there's the terpenes, which are in the beginning, then the cannabinoids, which are more than 70 substances identified from the cannabinoids, flavonoids, pigments, sugars, and all of the other substances that are nobody cares about are part of the plant. But the main ones are these ones, these over here. So the cannabinoids and the terpenes. Uh, yeah, so there are many types of cannabinoids identified in the plant. So the psychoactive ones, uh, this is the main psychoactive substance, THC. In the natural, okay, so it, it's in the natural form in the plant, there are the cannabinoid acids. So uh, in the plant, there are only THCA, THCVA, CBNA, and CBCA. Only the acid forms are in the plant. This is the natural substance. Uh, after heating these substances, they decarboxylate, this is the term, which they will remove that uh, molecule here, thing here, and they, they become the active psychotropic form. Otherwise, cannabis is not psychotropic. Like if you take the plant, if you eat the plant, nothing. So basically like arugula. Nothing, yeah, like arugula. Yeah, you can use cool. it as a spice. You can, you know, just like yeah. this. <laughs> it, it's just a spice, yeah. But if you heat it, like like smoking or like if you bake it or bake something, it, yeah. bake it, yeah. yeah. Then it's a problem. You get baked. Then it's a problem, <laughs> yeah. And that's why THC, this is the other substance, THC, CBN, they have different, completely different effects, like nothing compared to one another. For example, uh, CBD and THC are both found in the same plant, but they have completely opposite effects. Like one, one is antagonist of this CB1 and CB2 receptor, the other one is... Uh, Antagon like agonist and antagonist. So there are many cannabinoids in the plants. All of them have different effects, and that's why different strains have different effects on the body because they have different composition of different substances. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's a much more lively presentation, Greg. I don't know. I mean, yours was kind of a downer. I mean, how you just, know? Just getting started, man. Yeah, just, <laughs> just give me a second. Warm me up. <laughs> Bring up my pharmacology shit. Let's see <laughs> what you got there. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, yeah. let's, let, let's go back to your, your thing. I mean, how do those goddamn mushroom things work? I mean, why do they work even the way that they do? Uh, well, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the synapse is, what neurotransmitters are, and we will enter into this discussion. So many of you have probably seen images like this. Uh, when you have two neurons that are making a connection together, they do so through what's called a synapse, which is the, the connection between those two neurons. So this is a neuron. There's a signal coming down this, one, this uh, axon here, which is an electrical signal. Then there's a space here called the synaptic cleft, which is an actual physical space between the neurons. And then you have the postsynaptic cell here, which is receiving the neurotransmitter here. So these vesicles, they're called, are filled with neurotransmitter, which are small molecules. <clears throat> The vesicles fuse with the membrane down here, and the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. So we're going to be talking mostly about serotonin in this case, because most, well, all classical psychedelics are active at the serotonin 2A receptor. This cell here, which is receiving signal, has a bunch of receptors on its surface, which are reactive towards different types of molecules. It depends on what synapse you're looking at. Well, let's talk about the serotonin one. So if this is a serotonin 2A receptor, let's say right here, the molecules of serotonin are going to come in and they're going to lock into the protein structure of that receptor and it's going to cause a conformational change in the, uh, in the protein which is going to actually open a pore 
in the membrane through which ions can flow. So in this case, uh, positively charged ions will then flow into the cell, uh, depolarize this side of the neuron, and cause that neuron to fire. This is how action potentials travel through the chain. This is, this is the structure of, of serotonin here. <clears throat> uh, so it's an indole ring we got here. We got an amine group here and an ethyl uh, on one branch uh, of the uh, of the molecule, um, you can see that the uh, particularly DMT and psilocin. So psilocin is the bioactive form of psilocybin, much like THC. The real deal. Yeah. So the yeah. similar, I, th I believe it's a hydroxyl yeah, exactly. group, which is uh, which is cleaved off of the molecule. But this happens in your body. It doesn't have to be done by heat. So this is done enzymatically when you consume it. But you can see that the structure of serotonin. And DMT and psilocin are very similar. DMT, by the way, this is what's in uh, ayahuasca, which uh, is famous in South America. Many of you probably heard of it. Uh, it's like this psychedelic brew. This is naturally found in the brain, and it's found in thousands of plants uh, around the world as well. <clears throat> Mescaline and LSD are a bit of an exception, yet all of these molecules fit into the structure of the serotonin 2A uh, receptor. So they, they are all serotonin 2A agonists, and they also have activity at some of the other family of the, the serotonin uh, molecules. Now, when we look at the distribution of the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, this is a PET scan. So basically, they're putting some kind of a fluorescently activated molecule into the brain, which is binding to the serotonin 2A receptor. And you find it, so it's a heat map. Anywhere the brain is burning up, that means it has a lot of 2A receptor. It's found in the cortex, only in the cortex, really. Not so much in the midbrain, none in the cerebellum, none in the brainstem, none in the limbic system, even, uh, for the most part. Uh, some in the hippocampus, actually, here, which is relevant. But, I mean, the cortex, as many of you know, is just doing all kinds of different things. It's like vision, taste, somatosensory, logic, planning, eye movements, blah, blah, blah. It's like doing a whole, whole bunch of stuff. So infusing the brain with a neurotransmitter-like substance indiscriminately is causing what happens on the next slide. So this is a study that was done in 2016, which is the first scan of a person actively under the influence of a psychedelic in a scanner. This was done by a group in, in London. Um, and this is with LSD. So what this is showing you is that, so they're measuring oh, like the correlative neural activity, which is the amount of blood flow that is uh, occurring in the scanner. And uh, the LSD brain is tripping balls, as you can clearly see, Yeah. Uh, at all Come levels that they're looking. <laughs> uh, compared to, and I think, so visual cortex is lighting up here. They're probably showing them visual stimuli. But the activation of the brain in response to that visual stimuli is way broader in the case of LSD. Remember, you are putting a, essentially a neurotransmitter mimic into the brain, which is causing activation of circuits which are not often activated through your normal daily life, which is why people have tend to have these very extreme experiences. Oh, yes. This, uh, I, I put a couple slides here kind of to address what you were talking about yeah. earlier, Lubon. Um, this is a, a chart which is essentially mapping the various risk in, uh, in different drugs. Uh, so on this axis here, we have the active dose to the lethal dose, which means if you're over on this side, the amount that you take to get high and the amount that you take to kill you is like very small. Heroin is not something you play around with. If you don't know how much heroin you're taking, guess what? You're in good chance of dying. And I would say that fentanyl is probably out here yeah, somewhere. Over there. Yeah, and not, <laughs> not one that you really want to mess around with. So on this scale, we have the dependence potential too. So uh, basically, up here is the worst place that you want to be. Uh, look at this. LSD and psilocybin and marijuana, I might add, which it does have slightly more addictive potential than, than those two, are physiologically and cardiovascularly remarkably safe. There was an, uh, a report of a guy who, instead of taking the recommended, well, not recommended, but uh, an average dose <laughs> average. of LSD. The police is coming, yeah. Which was about 250 yeah. micrograms. So that's 250 millionths yeah. of a gram. This poor son of a bitch <laughs> thought that this bag of white powder was cocaine that he took a gigantic line of, which is probably like half a gram or something like this, and he lived to tell the tale. I, comfortably, I would say. I mean, you know, he 
I'm sure, <laughs> visited other realities and that sort of thing. But see, you have to tell the tale nonetheless because they are not threatening to your cardiovascular system. They're not going to stop your heart. They're not going to make you hyperventilate. Uh, they're not going to affect your breathing, whereas things up in here are definitely going to do that. Alcohol. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Cheers. It's too bad we aren't all smoking pot in here. <laughs> Instead. Uh, and this is just a different uh, map. I think this is the, oh no, this is 2010. Maybe that other study was the one you were talking There's about. There's a follow up from 2016. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think similar findings. Basically, alcohol, heroin, crack, you're going to find those in the shitty list, like wherever you go. Uh, but similar types of findings here the LSD and mushrooms, cannabis a little higher on this list. Uh, but all in all, much safer than, uh, than the, the typical su suspects, which this is fully legal. This is was called heroin because it was supposed to be the thing that rescued us from morphine addiction and to be used in a clinical setting. Yeah. Uh, cocaine, you know, for sure had uh, had medical purposes at some point and it was in Coca-Cola for a long time. So, yeah, But if you're taking, let's say, if you're smoking cigarettes, you might as well be taking cocaine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great rationalization. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. Amazing, amazing. You learned something today. <laughs> I'm learning stuff literally every few minutes. Uh, I love the fact that, um, like, when we're looking at the synapses, he could be bullshitting us forever, and nobody would know. It's like, you know, with the, you know, with the thingamajig, with the transporter, it goes to the space and does things. I thought you were a scientist, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, way no. So, um, what would be? Uh, let, let's jump back to uh, Edwin again for some uh, actual content. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what would be the pharmacological applications for, let's say, uh, yeah. cannabis yeah. to begin with? The picture. I the applications would be the picture. Yeah. So, uh, I need to start with the terpenes because they are the ones that modulated the whole effect. And there are so many types of terpenes in different types of cannabis strains because if you if you if you have ever seen cannabis in real life I and haven't. Sm yeah of normally I haven't uh, of course. Uh, and the difference in the smells actually is the terpenes. The terpenes are actually the aroma of the cannabis. So different strains have different aroma, which means that they have different compounds inside. And these compounds exert different medical effects. Oh, let's say, okay, not, not medical, but effects, different effects on the body. And you can see there are so many types. And some plants contain very big quantity of them, but in different ratios. So a plant can contain, for example, 100 types of terpenes, but 10 of them can be dominant. And the effect you feel is mainly modulated through these 10 substances. So, uh, uh, something is interesting in the cannabis field that was discovered because of cannabis was the entourage effect. So, the entourage effect is technically how terpenes, flavonoids, which are the, um, the flavor substances. So, this is the aroma substances, this is the flavor substances, and then the phytocannabinoids. These are three groups of substances that are present in the plant, in the resin of the plant, mainly in the flower. So, these substances combine in a way that they modulate the effect of the more or less the only dominant psycho psychotropic substance, which is this one. Yeah, so, um, different terpenes can uh, produce different effects, and the most interesting thing is that the entourage effect represents um, an interesting effect that is how uh, substances that doesn't have any activity on a certain illness or a certain condition, they begin they began to exert activity. For example, um, for example, there is there is a no very well known synergy between CBD cannabidiol and THC. Uh, for example, there is a very interesting study from Dr. Sanchez in Spain, uh, where she um, it's a, it's an in vivo study on mice that she tries. CHC, CBD together with the standard of care temozolomide on um, brain cancer. So, uh, and the effect is very interesting that together, the temozolomide together with these substances exert much larger effect. And I, the, the effect is one plus one is more than two, like one plus one equals five. So these substances increase the potency 
of the other substances multiple times, either though they don't have by its own zero activity. So they act like a multiplier, essentially. Like a multiplier, but by themselves they don't have any effect. Yes. So this is the, the interesting thing that was discovered with, with cannabis. If you can move to the next slide. These substances act on the endocannabinoid system. So this is a system in the body that um, regulates different processes in the body. And there are the, um, two, two major receptors that are discovered, CB1 and CB2. And by the way, an interesting uh, story is that the guy who discovered and elucidated the structure of THC is a Bulgarian. So he's called Professor Meshulam, Rafael Meshulam, in the Hebrew University of Israel, who uh, actually speaks perfect Bulgarian. And I met him once in uh, a conference. So he's the guy who actually elucidated uh, THC, CBD. He has a very interesting story about that, how he got some hashish from the police and then decided to what to, else would you to get? To investigate it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he decided that he wants to investigate some the best THC. One. Yeah, and he was thinking where to do. Like, let's let go to the police. Yeah, and he get five kilos of hashish for a trial, of course. <laughs> yeah, and he brought it in the bus in the public transport. And the story is very interesting. He's saying like, I'm in the bus with the five kilos of hashish with the letter of the police, of course, that I can carry. <laughs> And it's smelling like <laughs> everywhere and everybody was like, fuck. <laughs> like, yeah, so he's the Bulgarian who actually elucidated the structure of THC and his colleague uh, uh, f discovered the CB1 and CB2 receptors. These uh, receptors, the CB1 are mainly in the neural system, so in the brain and in the spinal cord and in the um, uh, neurons. CB2 receptors are also present there, but they're concentrated in the immune system the spleen and in different organs, uh, the gut and different other organs, mainly involved with the immune system. So that's why cannabis has very interesting effects on the immune system and uh, on the nervous system, of course. If you can move to the next slide. So uh, the interesting thing in cannabis is that one plant contains two of the substances that are contradicting, uh, like ag agonists and antagonists. So THC is an agonist of the CV receptor. But CBD is an, um, it, it's a partial antagonist of the CB1 receptor. So uh, THC binds to the receptor, but CBD modulates the receptor in a way that THC cannot bind to the receptor. So that's why if you smoke too much pot, get some CBDs to, to ease the, the effect. Yeah, CBD actually blocks a bit of the, that. And uh, let's, let's not call it blocks, but modulates in a way that is less intensive. Balances, so it you know. balances, yeah. So if you overdose or something like edibles, because it's like very common to overdose on edibles, you can get some CBD in the system to actually balance it out. Yeah. So that's why THC has like relaxation effects, like altering sensation, fatigue and sleep, pain relief, of course, antiemetic. CBD has completely different effects, like anti-anxiety, neuroprotective. THC in high doses can be uh, anxiogenic. So it it makes you anxious. Uh, CBD is com the opposite. In high doses, it's actually anti-anxiety agent. And now, now is actually now is this now, here is it's the same <laughs> fucking picture. Now, yeah, it's the same Whatever. place. Yeah, but they they act in the, this is the same place. Yeah, uh, it's the same neuron, presynaptic, postsynaptic, and the magic is happening here, like with all of the drugs, right? There, there. Yeah, this is the, the action side. So yeah, uh, the long story short, um, the interesting thing is that in uh, cannabinoids have different effects in different parts of the brain, which is the interesting thing. Like it's uh, a little bit strange to the pharmacology that a substance can um, inhibit the activating neurotransmitters in some region and inhibit the uh, inhibitory. Uh, neurotransmitters in a different region. And it's a very interesting um, study with PTSD, which proves that um, the point, if we can move to the next slide. So, uh, cannabis is, uh, PTSD is a very interesting thing that uh, actually it makes you, um, it, there is a circuitry in your brain that constantly worries about, it's in the, in the amygdala, Amygdala, com amygdala communicates with the prefrontal cortex 
and the amygdala decides what feeling to give you. Like, uh, if, if you see a lion, amygdala double checks with the prefrontal cortex if this thing is dangerous, safe, good, or bad. And amygdala gives you the decision. This is dangerous. So you feel like you're in a danger. The prefrontal cortex has the information, but amygdala does the decision. And in PTSD, amygdala is activated, like in a um, problematic way, it's too activated. And the prefrontal cortex is inhibited. And what cannabis does, uh, THC specifically, uh, in low doses, lowers the activity, the technically the neurotransmitters in the amygdala, but uh, increases the activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is strange to the pharmacology that it exerts different effects in different brain regions. And that's why it affects uh, PTSD, and that's uh, studied like a clinical trial with some good graphics about it, how it lowers the effect. And yeah, it's an interesting story, but... Specifically about PTSD, by the way, there was, uh, I don't know, I, I probably heard it somewhere recently, that it was related to... Um, a reduced ability to uh, forget, essentially. So it was uh, correlated with uh, some sleep disorders, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's the 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 PTSD is uh, let's say um, the very um, exaggerated disease. Let's say it 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 starts from with anxiety, stress disorder, and then moves on to um, to this more um, lower forms of uh, PTSD and then to strong like uh, PTSD with nightmares and different other. So it's it's a com complex disease of different yeah, conditions. Yeah. Endless fucking anxiety. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. So um, <laughs> given that uh, cannabis has been legalized in a bunch of places at this point, a while yeah. psilocybin and, and you know um, all the different substances that you know get us there uh, have not. Yeah. Has <laughs> this uh, been um, like a bigger boon on research? Because the the presumption that we're having right now, yeah. let's say, about legalizing some kind of uh, psilocybin, etc., would be that research would be benefiting from this. Yes. Have we seen this with cannabis? Yes, for sure. Uh, the last five years was were a boom of cannabis research, like more than thousand articles, like every day, 50, 50 articles every day, like PubMed was exploding. Yeah, so as a lot of research on cannabis, and actually, this I I believe this was one of the f like fuels that uh, fueled the legal the legalization because um, the more research, the, the there was the more data that it's not that dangerous, it's not a gateway drug, it's not that, it's not this, it's not the devil, like uh, as it was uh, described, and that yes, of course, there are some medical benefits. Uh, on top of that. Uh, so the more research, I believe that the people and the scientists and the governments are more prone to actually be more calm about some change. I believe cool. uh, right now um, there is also many studies on uh, different psychedelics that are picking up because I see more and more... Yeah, definitely picking up. Although many yeah. of them are being funded by, by private money. Uh, yeah. That was the case in the States for a long time. It's been the case in across Europe as well. Although uh, in the States, there, well, I'll talk, to it, I'll talk to you guys about it in a little bit, with MDMA specifically, uh, that some of the studies have reached uh, phase three trials, which is the step before they're legalized for medical purposes. Once that, basically once, so they're, they're now authorized for like extraordinary use. There's some category. Like vaccines. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> That's why I don't put it in my body. Joking, joking, joking. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, so MDMA. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we're on sort of the threshold with psychedelics. And many of you may know that in the States, uh, it is decriminalized in a few states now. Uh, it's, so basically, you're not going to get prosecuted if you, if you use it. I think it's going to go more in that direction. Uh, which I feel happy and a little bit nervous about, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about it a bit a bit more. Um, so I mean, uh, I think that's about the point where we need to look at some practical applications, I guess. For I mean, uh, what would be the most obvious low-hanging fruit that we would potentially be able to solve with psychedelics? 
Well, there's quite a few of them, if, if you wouldn't mind turning my slides on. Uh, first, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of where the field is in terms of studies of depression. So depression is one major uh, disorder that people are trying to figure out with psychedelics. Depression, anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, uh, like existential fear of death, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, but this is a meta-study. So meta-studies are where they're reviewing the literature and they're assembling all the data they can find that fit within the parameters that they're looking at to see how a drug works. So this is a study of SSRIs. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which means that they're a class of drug that prevents serotonin getting sucked out of the synapse. So when you when you inhibit the enzymes that's removing the synapse or removing the serotonin from the synapse, then you have more serotonin available. And the idea is that it increases the serotonin tone in the body. These have been used for about 30 years or so, maybe a bit more than that. And there's between about six or eight of them on the market. And these are what are uh, traditionally is prescribed. And so what this meta study is basically finding, the, the, the meat here is that you want to be looking at this green box. So this is the severity of the study, which is, this is a, basically a, like a psychological test which uh, is administered to, to patients to assess the degree of their depression, that the only time in which you start to see significantly different results between placebo and the administration of SSRIs is when you have extremely severe depression. In cases of mild depression, it's just a, it's a, it's it's kind of a fun. mess. Yeah, it's just not doing a whole hell of a lot, unfortunately. But like with everything, when you're averaging a lot of people together, you'll miss individual effects. So if you're doing a study where you're looking at 50 people at the same time and you average them all together, you might find that there's little to no effect, whereas a couple people in that study may have benefited greatly. This is the future of medicine, I think, is being able to determine who, given their genetic and epigenetic makeup, is going to be have a, a better response to a specific substance. So uh, when we talk about psychedelic therapies, one of the things that's, uh, that's really important to keep in mind is the set and setting. That's something I've, I've talked about before. So in all of the, the studies that we're going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes here, this is kind of more or less the way in which these drugs are administered in a clinical setting, where you have a, a nice comfortable room, you've got a couch for the person to lie on, you've got some art on the walls, oftentimes there's plants in the room, there's a trained therapist in the room, sometimes there's two. Oftentimes the people are listening to music. Uh, mostly, most of the time they are given the same music to listen to on headphones. So they're in, they're in a safe environment. Whereas the way in which these substances have been traditionally administered is in more of a ritualistic type setting and often in a group setting where there's a shaman or somebody who's leading the ceremony who's very well experienced uh, in, in what these substances can do who will lead people through singing and dancing and chanting and these types of kind of ritualistic uh, behavior, behaviors which they have found over the years to be you know, beneficial for the experience. So this is a different kind of set and setting. And this is the one that Dubo is most familiar with, is, which is tripping Indeed. balls with <laughs> mud inside your butt crack and uh, driving around on a bus like a bunch of kookity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is... Kind of what most people associate with the 60s, 70s uh, era, <laughs> which no wonder people were scared to death. You know, <laughs> it's like I have no doubt in my mind that these people are having the, the time of their life. There's no doubt about that. It's just how do you control for this type of experience? You know, it, that's I think one of the most difficult things to control for is. Okay, so you're giving somebody music to listen to. So have they heard that song before? Do they like that kind of music? Were they, you know, traumatized when they... There's such an individualistic uh, kind of connection to the set and the setting that I'm thinking that it's going to be difficult to tease this apart. Isn't this literally the same problem with personalized medicine, though? I mean, what you said earlier was that essentially if you're trying to control specifically for the ones that are having the greater effect, mm -hmm. let's say, from those 50 people, uh, wouldn't this be the same issue? I mean, you're trying to gauge the types of responses that a certain amount of people would have to those substances. Well, I mean, for sure. There's no doubt that from a physiological standpoint, these substances are increasing neuroplasticity. They are increasing activities at the synapses. How that relates to modulation of these behavioral effects that we're going to talk about is definitely very personalized. So different people are going to react to it differently. But what you'll find across the board is that the 
the size of the effect is in a totally different category than you see with, uh, with SSRIs. And the application is so wide. So this is one that I think is particularly important to show here in Bulgaria, given that the, the smoking rates are, are incredibly high. Um, so in, in contrast with programs, that, you know, there's lots of quit smoking programs. I mean, many of you have gone through it. I've gone through it in my 20s. They're trying to quit smoking, it's, it's freaking hard. Um, and so these are, this is probably the best one that we have thus far, these nicotine replacement, like the patch or gum, something like this. Psilocybin, this was an early study, by the way, which was statistically underpowered, uh, was finding that 80% of people had a, a dramatically reduced desire to smoke six months to a year out. And if you change the next slide, this is sort of the updated bit of data which was done uh, a few years ago by the same group. Um, what they're doing here is that they're not just taking people's word for it as to whether or not they quit smoking, they're actually measuring physiological variables. So they're measuring the amount of carbon monoxide in their breath here. So this is at intake, this is day one basically where they're measuring their baseline. Look at how many of them drop to basically zero all the way out from 10 weeks, six months, 12 months, and, and the long term, which I think is two years. Okay, so this might be a really fucking dumb question, but... What, what what are they doing? I mean, there's some kind of protocol to 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 keep. I mean, are they just taking psilocybin and, and being told don't smoke? I mean, what? yeah. Well, there's there's like a, a therapy which is similar to the ways in which like anti-smoking therapies are are typically done. So you have a trained therapist who is taking you through to setting intentions, trying to direct your thoughts through the plasticity which is happening in your brain to set these intentions. I mean, we all know that the placebo effect is definitely a thing. When you believe that something is going to be working, it has a tangible effect on the, on the circuitry of your brain. So, so it's basically combined with psychotherapy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a... Yes, yeah. absolutely. That, and that's a really important aspect of this. And like I said before, it's not like, uh, you know, a hippie in the middle of a field as a music festival isn't going to want to... or won't stop smoking. I mean, it's going to happen in those uh, circumstances too. It's It's just... How do you optimize the effect of the drug to get the effect that you want? So here, this is a, this is a uh, cottonine is a uh, metabolite of nicotine. So they're finding similar things. Again, they're just trying to pick out people who are lying. We said, oh, I, dude, I totally quit smoking. And then they're like doing these blood tests and, and verifying it. So again, like you would see at any smoking cessation, you have some people who jump up from this baseline here, but quite a few of them who stick to it. This is another interesting one here. This is the number of cigarettes per day. Many of them go down to this baseline, but there's a general trend towards some of the participants increasing their number of cigarettes per day, which is, again, what you would expect. When you're messing around with your addiction system, your nucleus accumbens deep in the limbic system, those circuits are extremely powerful. So even a very powerful substance like this is going to have a hard time you know, solving it for everybody. This graph, I think, is particularly interesting. So what they're looking at here is they're trying to gauge through these psychological tests what the degree of mystical experience that this particular person had. So did you have a transpersonal experience? Did you, you know, dissolve your ego? Did you have an experience with God? Did you have, uh, like, a transformative experience which manifests in whatever way it's going to manifest for, for you uh, if you take it? So in your case, the devil. Uh, so if, if you have a higher degree of mystical experience, it's correlated with a greater success rate in quitting smoking. So puzzlingly, in my opinion, there are some people who are trying to make modifications to the chemistry of psychedelic substances to try to remove the psychedelic aspect to it, try to remove the, the kind of subjective trip while maintaining the pharmacological effects of the plasticity induction, which I think is, I don't know how, how <laughs> they can possibly hope to achieve that. Uh, but, hey, if they do, you know, that's going to convince a lot more people to take them, I think. So, um, okay, but, uh, again, how do, we, how do we approach which of these, uh, which of these uh, potential areas, like depression, etc., are the ones we should be focusing on. I mean, how do we know that, let's say, psilocybin isn't some kind of amplifier in the same sense that uh, uh, marijuana, etc., is for something else? I mean, uh, what is the baseline that we're using? What are we stepping on in order to identify such potentials? I mean, is it something relating to the form of the molecule? Is it something else that we know already? 
uh, that is, let's say, similar to other drugs that we're using right now? Or That's a really good question. I, mean, I have similar questions as to why when people are taking these hallucinogenic substances, why the outcome, even when people have horrible trips, is in the long term positive. That for me is an, an open question. I can't answer that for you. And I don't know that many people could. I'm sure people have theories, but... Uh, and anecdotes. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of those. <laughs> Plenty of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, here, I want to take you through a couple more instances of this, sure. if you wouldn't mind. Um, so this is another early, early study, uh, I think there's one done at Johns Hopkins, where there's a, a dose response in the amount of psilocybin that's taken of the reduction in, so basically the higher the bar here, the more the reduction in depression, which lasts six months out from the administration. Most of these studies are done with two doses of psilocybin, sometimes three, uh, about three weeks apart. So just consider that for a second, too. It's not like you're taking an SSRI, which you're taking two times a day indefinitely. This is something you're taking twice. Totally different class of, of, of like power of this molecule. This is not treating a symptom. This is treating the actual cause, the, the circuitry in your brain, and rewiring it to take your mind out of the kind of negative behavioral patterns. So I think that's the general idea is you... Are, are breaking up these circuits which are chronically, you know, used in a negative way. And this one uh, was also done by the, the same group, I believe. Yeah, this one just came out, actually. So this is looking at uh, effects of psilocybin therapy on depression. So similar types of things. This is a, a depression score that's being taken with a uh, psychological test. This is measuring baseline at eight weeks, three weeks, and the day of. So this should be just giving you an idea of what a person's baseline is. And when you see the slope of these lines falling down, one week after, you can see how many people had a massive benefit from this, which lasts until four weeks out. I mean, some of these longitudinal studies, they're expensive and they take a long time to do. So in this case, they're looking at four weeks out. What happened to that guy over there? Oh, I'm going to get to that guy. Don't you okay. worry. Yeah. Right. yeah, don't you worry. Yeah. I've got a, even a name for that guy. Yeah. So this is... <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is cognitive flexibility. This is what you were talking about earlier, about PTSD being a form of being unable to unlearn something. You can think about it as forgetting, or you can think about it as being unable to modify a memory every time you re-encode it when you remember it again. Memories are notoriously flexible for, for many people. So in this case, what you're hoping to see is they're giving people these cognitive tests, and the more cognitively flexible you are, the more you're able to adapt to the, to the, um, the question at hand. So you want to see these numbers dropping, uh, and what they found overall is that there's a reduction in the uh, in the this the what's called perseverative errors. Um, and this guy right here, our, our old friend, is just like a professional devil's advocate. I think it's probably Newball. I think would react this way. <laughs> but it's interesting to see that there are cases like this, and it's one of those instances where you're scratching your head and thinking. Is this potentially dangerous for this person? Uh, you know, if if they're becoming more depressed with the use of it, which is not unprecedented, by the way, SSRIs ca have caused a ton of teen suicides. For example, there there's a lot of instances where people become more depressed with commonly described uh, antidepressants. So it's not like this is cause for you know extreme alarm. But it is definitely something that uh, you know is is concerning. Uh, right, this is the one I, I was excited to tell you about. This is a classic study done at Johns Hopkins, one of the one of the first ones of its kind, that was looking at anxiety in people with terminal cancer. So imagine what it would feel like to go to your doctor and for them to tell you that you have six months to live, and just how much that would fuck you up for most people. I mean, a lot of like. How am I going to, first of all, just the, the shock of hearing that, the reality sinking in and not knowing what's next, you know, all of the existential and difficult questions that would arise uh, in that circumstance. So what they did was they took uh, a bunch of these terminally ill cancer patients <coughs> who had severe anxiety about uh, death, and they enrolled them in the study and gave them psilocybin in, I believe it was four different doses. Here there's only, there's two of them listed here. Um, so this is, uh, again, th so these are all, there are three different depression inventories that are being taken. So the, the lower you are, the less depressed you are. 
And what you see here is a dose response curve. Again, blue is a low dose, red is a high dose. And there is a persistent reduction in depression in these groups six months out. There's a significant reduction in anxiety six months out. I should also say that I believe it was 95% of these patients rated the high dose of psilocybin experiment as amongst the five most significant experiences in their life. Something like 50% voted it as the, most, the single most uh, important experience they've ever had. And this uh, kind of quality of life measurement, uh, acceptance of death, uh, was also dramatically improved. So this is a drug that helps to cure the existential fear of death, <laughs> which is not something you necessarily go into the pharmacy and you're like, give me that thing off the... Give me two of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so driving home the point that when you are taking what's essentially, what's essentially a plasticity inducer, that there's a very broad number of effects that can be addressed uh, with that type of, of drug. So are, yeah. we, are we getting close to any kind of uh, at least uh, more liberal authorization for clinical trials, etc., specifically for psychedelics? Mm. Let me show you uh, one, one more slide really quick, and I'll answer your question with okay. it. Uh, sure. Could you go to... Uh, well, just quickly with this one. So I wanted to, to add to what everyone was saying, too, about uh, PTSD being a disorder, essentially, of overactivity in the amygdala. Um, what MDMA does, many of you know it by ecstasy, um, it is... Uh, many of you. Yes. <laughs> it's being used... Um, it's still, psilocybin and MDMA are probably the substances most commonly used. MDMA is not considered a classical psychedelic, but it ha does have psychedelic qu uh, qualities to it. It is a serotonin 2A agonist, but it also acts at different areas, um, specifically in the oxytocin system, which is like the love bonding hormone you know, that a mother would have cr cradling a baby. So it, it brings about feelings of, of pleasure and contentment and, and safety. In addition to reducing activity in the amygdala, which is the part of your brain which is, you know, scaring the shit out of you, which is the part which, you know, when you're reliving this traumatic memory is activation of uh, the amygdala is a part of the memory. It's not something which is, you know, associated with it or something. The memory is the amygdala activation. So the idea is that when you give MDMA in this safe, uh, this safe setting, that you're taking advantage of the, the idea of, of memory consolidation, which is you have different types of memory. You have short-term memory, it's the last couple seconds. You have a longer form of short-term memory, which is minutes to hours. And then you have long-term memory, which requires sleep and protein synthesis in order to strengthen the synapses and make that memory kind of more persistent. So the idea is every time you remember something, you recall something, you're bringing it back up into your consciousness, and then you re-encode the memory again. You go through the same steps of protein synthesis and that sort of thing with the context that you remembered it in. So this is one of the ways in which mem memories are consistently modified over time. Um, so the idea is that let's, let's do this therapy. Let's have you bring up your trauma with a trained therapist in a safe environment in feelings of more relaxed emotional state so that when you re-encode the memory, it doesn't have that sharp fear aspect to it as strongly anymore. So these studies are, are typically repeated a couple times. This is one of the uh, initial pilot studies. And if you uh, change to the next slide, please. This is from the, the Rick Doblin group at MAPS, uh, which is a famous organization in the States. If you want to learn more about this, by the way, I recommend checking out their website. It's called uh, MAPS, M-A-P-S. This data is hot off the press. It just came out. Um, and what they're looking at here is basically the same thing. So red is with MD and M N M D M M D M A M D M A shouldn't have taken so much right before this. <laughs> and on the left here, well, that is not the context for. It. I would take uh, something else. But this is uh, this is therapy only. So what you're seeing is what you're looking for is an increase in the dark red bars relative to the blue one dark red bar here. This is total remission. This is complete absence of PTSD uh, entirely, whereas you have the kind of the more mild form of the improvement of the, of the disorder called loss of diagnosis, and then you have people who responded, but were not fully better. And you can see that across the board you have a, a, a 
very good improvement across all of these groups, particularly after three sessions here, interestingly. So what I was going to get at is that this is a phase three clinical trial. This was done with a much more, uh, much higher statistical power. I think there were something like 100-ish uh, participants in this. So this is the kind of study, phase three, at least in the States. Uh, I'm not as well versed to, in it's kind of the European standards. But this is the type of data that would convince the FDA to make it legal for therapeutic purposes. Now, what the... Thanks, man. What what the um, the protocols are going to be in terms of how do you train the therapist to be able to be qualified to do this kind of work? That's a whole different and open question. And I'm sure that MAPS has a lot of answers for that sort of thing. So basically, you need some pilot studies to prove some form of viability, and it would be difficult to get, and it is difficult apparently to get uh, permission to do them. But they would be a case study in potentially having you know, looser restrictions for you know, just doing research on this. Yeah. I mean, I think for the researchers who see the potential in these, that's the goal, is to make them legal for therapeutic purposes. <clears throat> is that some specific safe haven where you can just go and you know, research whatever the hell you want? So, for example, if we go to China, uh, do they give a shit? I would say they probably give more of a shit than they do here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depending upon where you are, but um, well, because uh, specifically China have some research uh, criteria which differ from you know the European Union and the US, etc., in terms of ethics, etc. So would would they be more willing to you know be guns blazing? I would uh, say you should probably ask a researcher in China. I don't think I yes. can answer that question. No, because already. you're a bit slitty eyed is what I'm saying. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> casually racist. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, what would what would our path be to not fucking this up, essentially? Because obviously it's starting to hmm. become like a resurgence, both in terms of cannabis and psilocybin, etc. Uh, it seems like there's some results that could be promising and it could be uh, something that yields um, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, positive effect. So how do we not fuck it up? How does this not get just canned immediately after a year? Well, uh, in my opinion, the way that cannabis was legalized in California is not the way that it should go. And now there is a greater public kind of uh, appreciation for it or acceptance of it because time has passed. But at the time it was being legalized for medicinal purposes, you go down to Venice Beach, which is like the most... <laughs> with like, the back pain. Yeah, exactly. Like... <laughs> Burned out hippie. There's this some dude with like, God, like get your like medical certificates or whatever, with like a sandwich board on, like smoking a joint. And so you go into a tent, and there's like a you know, like a bum basically wearing a white lab coat, and says, "Yeah, dude, you look sick to me," and writes your thing. And then you go to the pharmacy, yeah. and you get a fucking orange bottle full of joints that you smoke like this. You have to put it in a context that is on par with the way that we typically take medicine. You know, it, that's not to say that it doesn't have an effect <laughs> that way, but why would you not synthesize the ingredients, combine them in ways in which Edwin knows a lot about, you know, to, to maximize their potential? It has to be treated in the same way like everything else. That was such a, such an American dream kind of thing. I well, mean, of course, because it was just <laughs> a, so it was a proxy war being fought by people who wanted it legal. And that's essentially what happened, is that, yeah. you know... Yeah, so, so no mushroom soups. Uh, no. I, no, I, no, please no, please <laughs> no. I, I just, it's, it's too important. It, it, yeah. There's too many people who are suffering tremendously in this world for this to get fucked up again. So, Ervin, what would you say would our path would be uh, to fix it up rather than fuck it up? To fix what? Oh, essentially, you have some medicinal value out of those substances. <laughs> there are a lot of places that people already get the medicinal benefit of these substances, I'm sure. But, yeah, I mean, like, in our territory here, it's not exactly the same. But, yeah, I mean, like, um, he's right that the approach, what was in the medical cannabis field, is not the right way to go with the psychedelics. Because probably something similar happened in the 70s, but yeah. not with the medicinal effects, but with the <coughs> recreational effects. 
So yeah, I mean like um, the medical the, the medical use can be compromised because of the recreational use. Yeah, actually. So yeah, I think we need to be careful with the with the recreational use, but yeah, the medical use should be allowed. This is an instrument in the uh, doctor's back. Let's say. Yeah. So. So, so you you're thinking in the direction again uh, what Greg mentioned that it should be somehow formalized as medicine rather than just buying a few joints from your yes local of course this, this, of course yeah because uh, also smoking cannabis to treat an illness is not correct like it's a, smoking is not a medical act smoking itself is burning the plant inhaling a smoke inhaling smoke generally is not okay like in any smoke. So uh, that's not the correct way to consume a medicine. Um, yeah, vaping. Vaping is more uh, correct way to inhale cannabinoids. Uh, and when I met uh, ten, five or eight years ago with the um, president of the medical medical cannabis program in Israel, um, who told me a very interesting thing that um, smoking should never be like legalized for medical purposes like only vaping and uh, formulations for oral ingestion so he's right like taking uh, 10 mushrooms to eat in, in a therapy probably is not the most controlled way to do a therapy probably needs to be a preparation mm. in a way that, uh, that which is analyzed and homogenized so you so you know what you're taking or you know what you're giving so, so uh, as, as long as you're mentioning vaping, isn't it, is, isn't it the gradation as well, though? I mean, smoking, obviously not amazing for a yeah. bunch of reasons, uh, but vaping isn't exactly the same as, let's say, taking a pill. So it would still be associated with some amount oh. of heating, etc. cetera, of mm, substance. Not exactly, because vaping, yeah, there is some very minute degradation, but it's negligible. But uh, the route of administration can make, the, can make a big difference, specifically in cannabis, because in THC, uh, when inhaled, you absorb almost the full amount of THC inhaled in, in its original form. But when you take it orally, your liver transforms THC into more potent 11-hydroxy-THC, which has uh, different psychotropic effect and different effect on the medical conditions. Like, it, it, it has completely different behavior. Different elimination, it's, it's a different substance, actually. So, route of administration is also very important in uh, while consuming THC for medical purposes. So in some cases, uh, in inhalation is preferable. In other cases, oral route is preferable. It, it depends on the type of effect that you're looking for. Exactly, yeah. yes. Um, okay, guys, I think, uh, I think it's time for us to look at some of the questions. Uh, wait, did you have any more slides you wanted to show? The A lot, but they're like too, too many. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Too many. It's been an hour, 20 minutes. Yes. I think for a bit with the slides. Yep. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a bunch of questions from the, uh, from the people in the audience. So guys, again, look at the thing, slide.do, code DMT, short for Dimitar, etc. <laughs> so uh, some of the questions, let's begin with the first one because uh, I'm lazy and I did not uh, filter them to begin with. Um, so what do we do, uh, what do we use for placebo controls in trials with substances with so obvious effect on the brain and consciousness? That's a great question and it's one that uh, yeah. professionals deal with too. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> the second you look down at your hands and you realize that you've turned into a dog, you probably kind of know that you took yeah. <laughs> this, uh, the hallucinogen. You're pretty sure about it. <laughs> yeah. What they, they use a, a few different substances. Niacin is one of them, which is a, it's like a vitamin essentially, but when you take it, it makes you feel a little bit jittery, like it gives you a, uh, like a body effect. But what there is beyond that, I mean, it's not like you can take the psilocybin molecule and just make one slight change to it and say, okay, but well, this is going to be our control. It doesn't, doesn't really work that way. It's a very difficult thing to do double blind. So that is a, tricky confound in some of these studies for sure what would you be looking for in a in a control i mean what kind of effect would you like to show to the potential subject so as to you know convince him that it is a, it, he's using actually the actual substance well i think that i mean people 
it's like it's like choosing a jury. You know, how are you going to find people who have never heard anything about a very famous case, for example? Like, how, how are you going to find people who have never heard any stories about what psychedelics are like? Like, people are coming into this thing knowing that, oh, I'm going to expect something. It's not like, oh, here, I'm, we're going to give you this venlafaxine. You're just like, what the fuck is venlafaxine? You know, it, where it, that's the case in most of these types of clinical trials. In this, people are expecting that something crazy is going to happen. So, uh, I mean, in... In most cases, you would be giving somebody a sugar pill as the placebo, but in this case, it's just not going to work because it's the, the person's expectations are in a different place than they would be in a typical there study. There needs to be some kind of effect. Yeah. It's a little bit different with the THC, by the way, because there were some attempts to create the placebo. It's very complicated, of course, but there was an interesting research about um, they chose... Cannabis naive patients, which means that they they've never used cannabis. They don't know what is it about. They don't know anything about the effect. Yeah, they don't know anything about the effect. And the um, researchers explained that the doses they are testing are so low that they will not does they will not feel any effect, even if it was a THC. Of course, people with the THC know very well that it was a THC, but the people in placebo didn't know that if they're getting they the placebo... They cannot be sure, basically. Uh, yeah, they cannot be sure, basically. So this was a, an attempt to actually somehow create a placebo without having the real... Like, just just edging them. Yes. Like, Amazing. Like, exactly. <laughs> so uh, as long as we're on the topic of um, uh, marijuana, there's another question um, by the audience that's... Some people experience panic-like attacks and rapid heartbeats when smoking marijuana. Does it depend on the person's mental health or is it basically on the additional stuff that the marijuana is mixed with? Yeah, so uh, there are a few reasons. The main reason, most common reason, is high dose of THC. So high dose of THC creates that. Uh, also, high do the second reason is high dose of THC with no or low dose of CBD. CBD contracts that effect. So taking CBD together with the THC actually blunts that um, the the heart these side effects. So uh, yeah, and also some some of the terpenes create that side effects in high doses. Like uh, beta myrcene is uh, also famous to actually excite the body and have an excit excitatory effect. And together with THC and especially in combination with low CBD, it can create these effects. But of course, from person to person is different. So uh, people which uh, get these effects can blend that with CBD. Another, uh, another zinger. What happens during a bad trip in brain chemistry terms? Go. Well, I think that obviously in a in a psychedelic state, as I was mentioning, and you saw in that uh, that MRI with the uh, with the LSD in the brain, is that it's activating circuits which are not typically activated. So I think one one thing that people experience is a profound feeling of loss of control, like their their senses aren't working in the same way that they typically do. Their sense of self is not functioning in the same way that they think they do. I mean, it's difficult to convey to somebody what it feels like to not have any idea who or what you are and uh, like to to substitute reality with something that seems completely foreign and yet totally familiar at the same time people panic i mean that, that's and understandably so sometimes particularly with with high doses so that's that's part of it and i think that uh, you know correlated with that you're certainly going to be having if you're having this fear response, you're going to be having uh, kind of some of those circuits being activated in the brain as well. So whether or not the the LSD of the psilocybin is in and of itself activating those circuits through its native activity, or it is being activated because the set and setting that you're in leads you down this path that pushes your brain chemistry in that direction is sort of an open question. But let's say let's say we put him tripping balls in a, a fMRI. Um, let's say in one of the cases he's just having his best life. I don't know why this is happening on the screen, but it's terrible. Um, 
let's say in one of the cases he's having the best of trips, and another case it's literally the worst of trips. It's like double Hitler trip. Uh, what would be the difference? I mean, in terms of uh, brain imagery, would we see a, di a difference, or it would be just homogeneous essentially? I expect that you would see a difference, particularly in amygdala as uh, activation, probably in prefrontal cortex as well. Studies just haven't been done. We I need mean, to do this. it's not like who's going to sign up for the bad trip study, also. And ha how do you make it happen? Also, yeah, I know I mean, a guy like, with an fMRI. <laughs> I've heard that you can just need to go with the trip. Yeah, the yeah, bad yeah. trip. I mean, like you just yeah. need to let it let go. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's what the therapists are there for. To, yeah, to that, remind that's you. What I, yeah, just let go and right uh, with it. The next fifteen questions are about psychedelics. Sorry, it's interesting. So, what's the best psychedelic for a first timer? <laughs> and uh, you, you, and like, uh, you should have been expecting this. For sure, not yeah, of course. As well as the question, sure, what's your personal probably. experience? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, I mean, not, those yeah. two are just like, we might as well get them out of the way now. For sure, not Dimitar. <laughs> yeah. Never Dimitar. Yeah, DM, Never Dimitar. DMT <laughs> is probably not the one that you want to go with first. No, that, no. That's the one, particularly when, uh, it, or at least in some of the studies where they're injecting it intravenously. Um, if you have no experience whatsoever with psychedelics or pot, that's gonna that's gonna <laughs> send you to a place that you never knew existed. It, it's just it's an incredibly like for example, you have reports of people who in these like legit clinic-based DMT studies report that the 15 minutes that they were tripping on DMT felt like thousands of lifetimes lived from birth to death. I'm not sure that you want to just like raw dog that <laughs> from day one, you know? Probably ease into it a little bit. Just 10 lifetimes. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's a more manageable <laughs> amount. I have a hard time with one lifetime, goddammit. Um, but no, I mean, I'm not going to put myself in the position here of, of recommending this to anybody in an illicit setting. The information which you will readily find on the internet is which is good, which is that you should start <laughs> small, make sure that you're not going to have a panic attack, do it in safe environments, that sort of thing. But uh, I think that the qualitative difference, differences between psilocybin and LSD are, are relatively small. <clears throat> you emphasized when, when we're talking about the history of um, psychedelics that it used to be more of a social thing. So it, the controlled setting back then was something that you do in a, a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, would this yield different results rather than just tripping balls on your own at home? I mean, uh, is there something to do with the social interaction that changes the trip itself? I think for sure, yeah. I, and this is what a lot of cultures around the world, I think, have empirically come to the conclusion about, which is that, I mean... It's used as like a rite of passage. Yeah, how many people these days would trip with their parents? Like, it would their parents would like give them these substances when they're 13 or 14? But with your parents, or would just with anybody's parents? Uh, just anybody's parents. At this point, take anybody. <laughs> no, I, I, there's the the social aspect to it is is critically important. But then again, is also based upon the individual too. So some people might get a better. Uh, you know, feeling out of it another way. Certainly being surrounded with, with people who understand what you're going through has got to be a massive help, uh, even if no more than just a practical level. So, yeah, I think for some people it would be massively beneficial. As long as those people aren't jerks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, given that uh, you're from the U.S., so we are ascribing to you literally all of our... Uh, preconceived notions uh, about uh, the United States of A. Um, is microdosing a thing, or is it just a thing for uh, Silicon Valley assholes? Yeah, it's mostly something like the articles you can read in Wired. That's sort of like the the, the place where this stuff exists. I mean, people definitely <laughs> do it. Uh, I don't think that it's quite as widespread as uh, the media makes it out to be. But certainly the use of psychedelics in the States has given rise, like uh, the... Uh, the biochemical technique of PCR, PCR tests, was invented under the influence of, of LSD. Excellent. Uh, the uh, microdosing and use of LSD at, uh, <laughs> at IBM was instrumental in the invention of the, of the silicon microchip. You know, there's yeah, so Silicon Valley, you know, 
Go players uh, reports like a so, much more. So, so what you're saying is uh, uh, silicon chips, uh, PCRs, vaccines, and uh, what else? Basically, this. I'm not. What's the connection? Drugs? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just trying to uh, get you down the rabbit hole of just like a conspiracy theory mm -hmm. on drugs. Right. We'll talk about that after. Um. But no, uh, people definitely experiment with it, you know. Uh, but I don't think that it's as widespread as people make it out to be. <clears throat> but whether if it's widespread or not, I mean, that's um, yeah, that, that, that's one part of the whole thing. But is it potentially useful? I mean, has there been any amount of proof that this actually works for something? Yes. Okay. Placebo yes. effect. Placebo effect. Yeah. Why not? That's a significant. It can be used effect. for that. <laughs> Probably not too much research, probably. And That's probably. interesting. Yeah, like a very low dose being used as the placebo in, in these studies. Wow. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> um, so back to some sciencing questions. Um, DMT, LSD, psilocybin, and other classical hallucinogens work through the same serotonin receptors, but have profoundly different effects on duration. Why? Well, they have different affinities for the receptors. I mean, yeah. you're the they trained are. pharmacologist. You probably so that's the reason. Better. Uh, different affinities, different eliminations of the substance. Different chemistry, so it makes it, the body eliminates it harder. And the affinity keeps the substance m more time to be stuck to the receptor. Because so of basically the chemistry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, I just saw they, they just solved the crystal structure, which is they, they can see the molecular composition of how LSD binds into the serotonin uh, 2A receptor. And they're trying to take the drug now, because now, now they know exactly what it looks like in, inside, so they can design a molecule to fit in there, but like have a different Topologically, duration. you mean? Like, uh, What's that? Topologically, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So that they can then extrapolate backwards what the chemical structure should look like based upon the dynamics of binding to be able to have it have a shorter duration. Like to give you an intense experience for 20 minutes and then shut it off, for example. I think that's yeah. the kind of chemistry that, that the potential for that stuff, sort of stuff is huge. I mean, I think that's the future of this field is not just in working with these substances, but in working with further engineered substances that are inspired by the use of our modern tools. Okay, I, I'm always fascinated when we get to topology in, in that type of uh, setting. So would this mean that the less time that it has to interact essentially with the receptor, ba basically making it a looser fit, correlates with uh, an effect that lasts a short amount of time? Mm, not exactly, but yes. Uh, because it can also have different affinity effects like electrostatic or other chemical bondings. Like also, th there is the co covalent bond, and uh, I w I've re read an article of people trying to, a scientist trying to develop a um, psychedelic that's uh, covalent bonding to the receptor, like it's like you're all the time in the trip. And it's just the idea, idea was the that's idea was to discover that in order to 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 reverse engineer it in order to create short acting uh -huh, short uh -huh. acting um, psychedelics. This because, will not go yeah, wrong. Because short acting psychedelics is what is preferable because like LSD and Cyl7, like 10 hours of yeah. therapy. Nobody has time for that shit. 10 hours of therapy. Come on. Like well, a I day of therapy. Like one or, one or two hours probably is something like optimal. I don't that's know. the other what thing. Do you think? Well, that's the other thing about this <laughs> that uh, we were talking about uh, the question of access to these types of therapies and, and where the future, like what the future holds. There are a few places, I mean, you can sign up for clinical, clinical trials, there are those that are going on, but there are a few places in the world where you can go uh, that are, I mean, there's some that are probably reputable, probably some not so reputable, they can go in South America to take ayahuasca. Uh, there's a place that you can go in Holland, in Amsterdam, to take psilocybin in a fully clinical setting with therapists who are there with you multiple times, and it is bloody expensive. 4,000. Yeah, at least right. I think it's a 6,000 euros or so, right. something like this. Yeah. Because you're, you're having the time of this many people dedicated to this experience. Not yeah. just the, the length of it, but multiple experiences, the follow-up visits. It's not as if you're just taking the drug and that's the end of it. You know, there, There's a lot of personnel requirements for this kind of thing. So that's, that's something that also kind of concerns me going forward is figuring out how to make sure that this medicine is, uh, is accessible. Yeah. yeah. 
and not just for Silicon Valley yuppies. Yeah. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of uh, the effects and and the longevity of effects, etc., why do you, um, in general um, people react differently to uh, psychedelics and potentially to um, you know all the other substances that we're talking about? Well, what's the genetic difference that basically encodes for this? Yeah. So genetic difference in amount of receptors, expression of receptors. Some receptors might have a small, slight variation. So, for example, a substance can have a little bit more affinity to your receptor than to my receptor. And amount, of course, there are a whole cascade of events happening after a substance goes to the pre pre to the synaptic uh, cliff. Is that cliff? Cleft. Yeah. Cleft, yeah. And it activates a specific receptor. Then there is a whole cascade of substances that needs to be in correct order. So every genetic variation in the pathway can create a different effect. It's a long story short. Of course. Yes. Many effects. Chemistry. Chemistry. Yes. <laughs> I guess. <It's laughs> pharma yeah. um, as long as it's not mathematics. Then it's, uh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> So um, let's uh, let's go one uh, abstract sidestep from the topic because again that's the third question that usually pops up uh, when we're talking about uh, psychedelics, uh, ego dissolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We kind of get to the point where we say, "Do you think consciousness is generated by the brain?" <laughs> you know, it's coming. <laughs> I mean, then, yeah. Um, yes, probably. Controversial. Yes, uh, although I have no, I have a friend who is uh, who researches disorders of consciousness, mm. and he's basically looking at brain. The question is: Is there a spot in the brain where consciousness exists, where you can turn it off with the transmagnetic stimulation, or with turn it up with a psychedelic, that sort of thing? I think that the the reality of the situation is that consciousness is the emergence of global activity. Uh, that's happening across the brain. All the processes. Yeah. So, so the symphony of all the processes together right. inside. It's, it's yeah. like a chain reaction of processes. Right. And a reaction to stimulus, probably. Right. I mean, Buddhists would strongly disagree with you. I mean, it's, it's a question. There's a lot of people who are going to disagree with you. Yeah. And uh, neuroscientists, of course, are going to, for the most part, be saying yes. Uh, you know, but there's always going to be the guy in the back of the of the room <laughs> inevitably is just stands up and wants to address everybody, you know, yeah. what is consciousness and go into some diatribe. And, you know, if you're that guy, yeah. then come talk to me privately afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. But yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's not go to panpsychism, uh, at least right now. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Again, I guess this could be related to uh, the topic on microdosing a bit. Um, at least that's one of the effects that um, uh, has been uh, described. Uh, rather, is there a learning ability increase when taking psychedelics? Uh, would this uh, have some kind of effect on the brain that allows it to, you know, uh, maintain its uh, plasticity for an ongoing amount of time, hence enhancing uh, learning ability? Yeah, I think that's the whole idea behind microdosing, is that you, you're increasing plasticity to a smaller degree chronically, which allows you to integrate information faster. Like people microdosing and playing piano, the idea being that you're going to be able to remodel the synapses faster to, to do it. I'm not familiar uh, to a great degree with the literature on microdosing. I'm not sure that there's a hell of a lot of studies that have been done on it. Anecdotally, I'm sure you can find people who would say that it's helped them dramatically. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the idea behind it. It's just like a, uh, a, a precisely controlled modification of plasticity. <clears throat> I managed to dig out the only other marijuana question, and it's <laughs> literally buried in the psychedelics and a bunch of stuff. But I think it's probably the most obvious questions for me. Uh, why are we so fucking hungry afterwards? I mean, what? Why? It's yeah. You know, calories count. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a hormonal effect, technically. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's there. The, there is one hormone, ghrelin, which increases and makes you hungry. It's 
direct correlation. Mm, chemistry. Yeah, chemistry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to do. yeah. <laughs> Again. Yeah. But it, it's not related to any action. I mean, uh, the, the hunger isn't after some an excess amount of spending of calories. Rather, it's just uh, stimulations of your urges to eat yeah, like a fucking it's pig. It's just your grilling goes up, and you're just hungry. Excellent. So you generally, what happens is you eat food. When the food is in your stomach, it um, It touches the mechanoreceptors, which gives a signal to the ghrelin to, you know, lower. Mm -hmm. like this And more chemistry. Like, yeah, too much. Yeah, Excellent. like technically that's, that's the reason. Excellent. And a few more hormones, which increase appetite. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you could live a thousand lifetimes if you trip balls in a significant uh, manner. Uh, why? Uh, why? Not sure I said exactly that. <laughs> Perhaps a person I can quote has you. the perception. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, 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 it, there is a certain time dilation <laughs> effect that's related with psychedelics, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. why? I mean, is there some specific thing that they're screwing up and playing with that we can localize in the brain potentially? Yes. There's, um, I'm trying to recall, it was a study on the claustrum, which is a really small area of the brain that's, so you have the cortex and then you have the midbrain structures. There's a large number of white, uh, well, axons, like white matter that comes down, and there's a little group of cells in there cl called the claustrum, which, if I'm recalling correctly, has to do with our perception of kind of sequential events in time, which does express serotonin 2A receptors and I think is modulated by psychedelic use, which is why people have this sense of distortion of time, which I think is... Oh, the same with the cannabis, yeah. They uh -huh. have the CB1 receptors, and cannabis also creates the time dilation and distortion moment. Yeah, then it was again some research on that uh -huh. area. So can yeah. can the specific uh, spot in the brain be stimulated in, in some other way? I mean, can we just take a pill and slow down time or something? Uh, like taking psychedelics? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Amazing. Answer the question. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I don't know that that kind of <laughs> recreational <laughs> research is being done yet with <laughs> neurostimulation devices, unfortunately. And the stuff that you can buy off the shelf typically will be giving you access to large areas of the cortex just because it's directly under the skull. You know, you put these headsets on, maybe they can stimulate something that's superficial in the brain, not deep <coughs> structures. A lot of these structures where some of the crazier stuff is happening are, are deep in the brain, which would require, you know, opening the skull, you know, planting an electrode in like you would for planting a stimulator for Parkinson's disease or something like this. But certainly um, when you use transmagnetic stimulation, which is magnetic pulses that you have like a little wand, that you can make somebody forget how to use verbs <laughs> all of a sudden. Like all these sorts of crazy effects. So without a doubt, you, know, you go poking around and... There's, you think neurosurgeons don't do that kind of shit for fun, <laughs> where their patients are under that they're just like, oh, what does this little group of cells do right here? You know, I, I mean, wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't shock me. What what would happen if you let's say you do a kind of a, a variation of a lobotomy on that uh, specific area of the brain? If you you know uh, extirpate that that part, would I mean I'm guessing there's a bunch of people with damages in that area of the brain. Do they experience some kind of uh, Uh, time distortion? That finding clean lesions is very difficult. Even um, Phineas Gage, who's that famous guy who got the railroad spike like through his face, he went through his, his hippocampus, which is kind of here in your brain. Sensor. Yeah. yeah, like one of the, uh, there was another patient, HM, who had it as well. It's, the, the cases are very few and far between. And Hippocampus is a much bigger structure than, than this one would be. So finding ones where you have selective damage that's not genetically based uh, is a tall order. So, I mean, maybe maybe there have been. I just, I don't know. <clears throat> Fucked up stuff. Yeah, because uh, something like a stroke tends to affect a wide area, or at least not necessarily a very discriminated area. But again, it maybe, maybe the... The utility of uh, of that zone would be dispersed in in the brain in some other forms. Yeah, well, that's the case with a lot of these kind of circuit based items. You have feedback between different regions. You have mm -hmm. like a whole, like the visual system, for example, mm -hmm. is not like it goes to this region and you can see something. It's going to like 
yeah. 50 different regions that are all talking to one another in complex ways. Yeah. Back of going online. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, before we uh, finish up, I have one more question. Again, I'd like to steer ourselves slowly into the direction of uh, uh, cautionary tale slash uh, pessimism, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, we're being a bit more liberal uh, with the whole thing. So the question is, again, in that sense, um, do you think that psychedelics can unlock some mental issues? Uh, and uh, can they be potentially reversed again with psychedelics? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I would say that's, <laughs> that would not be my first recommendation as the physician seeing a patient who lost their mind taking acid. Like, why don't you take some more acid? <laughs> take some more. Take some more. <laughs> yeah. Probably we can get I you back. Know. I mean, <laughs> I got maybe. the good stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I seriously doubt it, though. Yeah. I think I'd prescribe cocaine in that case. <laughs> Something that brings you down to earth. Oh, no, jokes aside, I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, um, in general, those substances having some amounts of uh, oomph, uh, we should be <laughs> we should be cautioning people against just trying to remedy stuff on their own. Yeah, without with, a, without a doubt. I mean, you're buying drugs on the street. If you've taken MDMA before, you almost certainly have not taken MDMA. It just as yeah. one example, like the kind yeah. of shit that shows up on the streets, you just, again, unless you have an NMR machine and are looking at this, you know, and have some idea of what you're doing, you're almost certainly getting something else which is probably contaminated with metabolites and, and byproducts of the synthesis. Um, yeah. Not, uh, not recommended. And, I mean, you can, if you look for this information, you can clearly find it. People have gotten themselves into some serious shit with psychedelics. And I am not here to tell everybody that you, I would not recommending it to everybody. You know, there are definitely people who should not be taking it. And uh, there are people who without a doubt it would damage. <clears throat> yeah. So self-medication is never a good option. Yeah. I don't think like not the best at least. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Self-medication. No. Okay, so guys, do you have uh, some final words as a closing? Anything you'd like to leave the people with except uh, kids don't do drugs? <laughs> well, kids should yeah. do drugs sometimes. <laughs> well, I think this gets back to this <laughs> this uh, topic we were, we were talking about earlier, is that we've, we're used to thinking about drugs as being this category of things that are illegal that all have this, uh, they're somehow related to one another. They're not related to one another at all. They're all doing totally different things in our brains. So you have families of drugs, of course, but to encourage people, I think, to, to consider that substances which society at large has considered to be dangerous or otherwise you know, harmful do have the potential to help a lot of people. Uh, and they also have the potential to hurt a lot of people. So I think that my desire to be here is to, I think, stimulate conversation about it educate people about the, the dangers and the promise of it and for people to make their own decisions and, and judgments about it. Всеки сам си прецени. Да, така. Да. Да. Ервин? I'll just join his opinion. Cool. Yeah, so no oh. self-medication. No self-medication. <laughs> well, unless, unless it's aspirin. Unless, uh, yeah. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. Good drugs. Let's give a round of applause for those two guys. Yeah. 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 <laughs>